All right, everyone, welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening. All right, thanks everyone, welcome. My name is Mitch Case and I'm with the National Arts Club. I just briefly wanted to introduce the National Arts Club to some of you who may not be familiar. Uh, the club is a 501c3 nonprofit based here in New York City with a mission to stimulate, foster, and promote public interest in the arts. Annually, the club offers more than 150 free programs to the public. This includes exhibitions, theatrical and music performances, as well as lectures and readings, and much more. For more information about the National Arts Club, you can visit our website at nationalartsclub.org or find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, um, as well as YouTube. And tonight's program is the second in a series presented in partnership with the Center for Art Law. I'll now introduce Atreya with the Center for Art Law to introduce tonight's panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mitch. And hello, everybody. Welcome to the Legacies of Artists, a conversation on artists' trusts and estates. I'm Atreya Mothra, the Judith Brusser Fellow at the Center for Art Law, and I'm so happy to be here for our event with the National Arts Club. I am here with the Center for Art Law's team, including our founder and managing director, Irina Tarsis, <laughs> a couple of our board members who have made so many of our programs and clinics possible, Bert Bendelman, Carol Steinberg, Tess Bonnelly, and a couple of our incoming interns in the summer, Murphy Chen. As Mitch mentioned, <laughs> this is the second event in a series of three events with the Center for Art Law and the National Arts Club as part of the Center's Legal Clinics for Visual Artists. So thank you to the National Arts Club for hosting these events, this beautiful space, and thank you to Ben, Nadine, Mitch, and Amy, who I've been working with throughout. And before we begin, let me let you know a little bit about the Center for Art Law and what we do. We are a Brooklyn-based research and education nonprofit, and we are dedicated to offering resources and programming to advance a very vibrant arts and law community. Through our website, our newsletter, our publications, we disseminate information and we try to keep our audience updated on all things art law, whether it's movies or podcasts or cases and events, we cover it all. We also facilitate tons of conversations, including our event today and clinical offerings as well. But of course, this doesn't even begin to cover all that we do. So we would love for you to take a look at our website and subscribe to our newsletter to receive updates. You may also consider becoming a premium member. And if you can, to make a donation to support our efforts to make art law accessible to everybody. We have some cards at the back of the room and we would love to give those to you after the program. The center is also continuously expanding in terms of events and staff. And this year, alongside the fellowships, we will also be having a director of legal services. We have a ton of exciting events coming up. And I wanted to take this time to mention that this summer we'll be launching our artist dealer relationships clinic. And this will be focusing on art contracts and consignment agreements between artists and galleries. And we're going to be pairing artists with our network of volunteer attorneys. And for that, we actually have another conversation happening at the National Arts Club next week and a couple of webinars and workshops as well. You can view these on our website and register for hopefully all of them so we can see a lot more of you. A few of the usual housekeeping items. There is a sign up sheet at the back of the room. So in case you have not filled that out, please feel free to do so. This program is also being recorded for archival purposes. So there's a little camera and if you walk by it, you can feel free to wave at it. If you have any questions for our panelists, we will have a short question and answer session at the end of the event. So you can keep those ready for the presentation. Here is actually a QR code, which you can scan on your phone. And this has a link to the handout and the materials for the session. It includes additional reading materials, and it also has the bios for our speakers with us today. We will be sending across these handouts as well as a recording of the session and the PowerPoint after the event. So make sure you fill up that sign up sheet and let us have your email ID. But coming to our program today, artist and legacy planning. Artists have several options when determining where their art will go and how it'll be distributed by the estate. 
And while art transcends art, it transcends time and space, artistic legacy, estate management, and intellectual property, these are complicated and practical issues that artists have to address in due time. Almost every artist dreams of having their work and their legacy reach far into the future, even after they've gone. However, the legacy and the estate planning process, it can feel long and arduous. And you sit at the crossroad of a variety of issues, whether it's conservation, appraisal. In order to secure preservation of artwork into the future, artists are forced to think about this issue during their lifetime. And sometimes the children or the family of the artists have to step in and try to navigate these issues with whatever resources they can find. So for this important and this interesting conversation, finally, let me introduce our speakers. We have Julia Sabo, a journalist who's dedicated to archiving and promoting the work of her artist mother, Martha Sabo. And we have Diana Huirbecki, an attorney specializing in art, estate planning, and tax issues for artists. So together, the people on the panel will discuss the ins and outs of legacy and estate planning from the perspective of an attorney and a family member planning for the estate of a loved one. So without any further ado, we're all so excited to hear from you. Julia, it would be great for you to give an introduction, start us off, and let us know from your perspective what it's like to plan for legacy and estate. Thank you. Thank you, Atreya. <laughs> For having me and thank you everyone for coming. Um, so I don't know if we have our PowerPoint up first, but I'll start by just saying, um, what is my legacy? <laughs> this is a question that every artist really should think about and not every artist does. So um, that's a very nice picture. <laughs> um, that's out there. Um, so so I happen to be the child of an artist who didn't think about, about where her hundreds of paintings would end up. So um, here, this is me with my dad, who was a curator at the Metropolitan. And this is obviously me with my mom. And if you look at my expression, doesn't it look to you like I'm saying, oh my god, look at all that artwork, who's going to take care of it? So, um, so basically, I should have started this project not long after this photo was taken, which was 1965. Um, but okay, so I started it two years ago. There you have it. Um, so my mother is still alive. She is sadly losing her sight to glaucoma and macular degeneration. Um, Okay, but um, now an attorney might look at this, especially this image, and think of it as an archival image. Um, it is that. It's also uh, a family. It's a family portrait. Uh, it's been very helpful to me to have these kinds of images for not only dating certain pictures that don't have a date, but also for orientation. There are some abstractions that, you know, I made the mistake of orienting vertically or horizontally when they should have been, uh, and you get the idea. Um, so if we can have the next slide. There we are again. So this is, this is one which is obviously uh, oriented horizontally, and I made the mistake of displaying it vertically, uh, I fixed that. So, um, so again, here we have this idea. I grew up with these paintings. These paintings, I'm the only child. These paintings are kind of like my siblings. And now they're kind of like my children. Um, and um, so, do you have the next one? Okay, so um, Martha has, in her career, had many different styles, and they all relate to one another. So obviously you're looking here at abstraction and, um, and color. And again, we have this challenge of which way is up. <laughs> um, but now, now I know for sure. Um, so, so there's this early kind of exploration of, um, of color and abstraction and color field. Then this kind of, um, we can have the next one. This one, well, it continues. But it gets to be a lot, then, then it kind of um, goes toward the architecture of New York, which is something that has always fascinated my mom. And um, 
this is definitely a kind of a missing link painting, and I only just recently unearthed this painting, so it's kind of magical to me. Um, so uh, in the beginning, because my parents lived in a building on 64th Street on, I don't know what floor it was, maybe the fourth floor, this was the view, right? Almost like a Manhattan Penge kind of thing. And then they moved to um, another apartment where they were more like on the 12th or 14th floor uh, on the Upper East Side. And I think we will see in the next slide, the vantage point changes um, to seeing entire buildings with some more space around them. And um, also the rooftops of more squat buildings. And now we're moving into the mid to, oh, uh, this, this is a, I put this in here because this is actually the back of the other one. So this is the back of the previous one. So it's just, you know, I'm trying to give you a sense of just the wealth of material I'm dealing with. And I'm, I, although I'm delighted to be dealing with it, it, is, it can be a lot. So, especially from an archival point of view. All right, so, um, Moving past my babyhood, um, uh, these two um, are actually in the collection of uh, the Vassar College, the Francis Lane and Loeb Art Center. Um, these, um, she had a tremendous uh, love of portraiture, and um, her portraits are extraordinary because when she ran out of, you know, when I stopped modeling for her, and you know, she ran out of ways to portray my dad. She would actually go to the Art Students League just for the models. She didn't, she already had her MFA, so she didn't need, you know, she didn't actually need instruction. But what would end up happening is she would, she would depict everybody in the studio. Not just the model, the instructor, the other painters, sometimes, let's see the next one, herself. So um, this is her, and then that's a model. And this is actually, this is, from back in Hungary in the 50s when she was getting her MFA. And the reason I show this is to just show the, um, you know, before you can be an abstract artist, I don't need to tell you people, you have to be able to know how to paint. And so so I also have in my, um, in my uh, conservatorship, shall we say, these beautiful, this is an incredible watercolor with incredible detail. Um, so, so now we so we have the, the New Yorkers as it will as it were. And then the next slide will show us probably okay, so now here we have they moved across the street. They were watching the building that we now live in go up on 81st and first from across the street, and they selected an apartment on the 22nd floor. So this gave them gave her rather a totally different POV. She would see these beautiful sunrises, sunsets. These abstract figures, she calls them, quote, the souls of transformed buildings celebrating. I'm sorry, I have not been talking into my mic. Maybe it's better. Um, anyway, so th this is called the souls of transformed buildings celebrating. This is a theme that would repeat itself almost the way Monet would do things over and over in different lights and different weather conditions. Um, so this became kind of a signature. So if you want to move the next one, as you see, so you can see a little bit of architecture in here, but there's a tremendous spiritual quality um, that transcends actual religions. It's just uh, people really respond to this work, and that's been very heartwarming for me and my attempts to get her recognized so late in life. Um, here again, here we have a nocturne. This goes back to the 60s. This is called film noir. And um, people who especially love old movies, myself included, really relate to this with the shadow. And here we have the rooftops again. So um, I recently wrote an article about my mother in the Purist magazine. And um, I came up with this idea that because my mother had a kind of a difficult um, life. She is a survivor of the Holocaust. She and my father came to this country from Hungary after the communists were had taken over. So she had her freedoms restricted twice. 
Um, and these cityscapes, sure, they're New York, but they're also a sanctuary city of the imagination. And I believe that's why people really respond to them. It's, um, it's like it, they take you away. I hope you all agree. Um, if you want to... Okay, so this is um, the piece that's actually on the invitation. And um, it's called... It's called Bridge After Sunset. And here you have the souls really beautifully articulated. They're very architectural themselves. They almost look like giant chess pieces for anyone who plays chess. Um, I don't, but anyway. Uh, so, um, so one thing that um, you don't really notice in these um, images or images of images is that, uh, you know, back in the day, my parents smoked. They did it very stylishly. Uh, they used actual Art Deco cigarette holders, but I couldn't stand the smell of smoke. So thankfully, my curatorial instinct kicked in as a child, and I made them quit, and they did. But now I have the issue of dealing with uh, restoration because just a little bit of smoking can dull uh, the colors of a painting. So this is one that is actually headed to the restorer very shortly, just to bring it back to its original vibrancy, which isn't too far from this. But this is an yet another thing that um, heirs to an artistic legacy have to think about, you know, is um, um, refreshing the work so that it not only looks the way it used to look, but so that it looks contemporary and of the moment for a new audience. Um, is that the last? Okay, so that's the last one. Um, these, are, these are some nice, <laughs> very nice bits of feedback I've gotten from folks, and these are all on the website, so I'll only read one, uh, which is by, from the artist Robert Harms, whose colleague Scott Kilgour is here with his beautiful wife. Um, and he said, impressive and beautiful. And that's, to me, you know, praise from Caesar. So that's why that has a, a pride of place. So um, when we ask, what is my legacy? I know that there, and Diana is going to, in her expert way, tell us about them. But um, from my point of view, it's really about um, preserving, protecting, um, and um, just supporting in every way uh, artists. Not just my mother, but all artists. And that's why the Center for Art Law is such a treasure. And I am so lucky that after weeks of hearing, we don't accept new submissions from galleries and hearing just walls of no, 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 no. I called them and they were enthusiastic and they wanted to collaborate and it kept me going. They and one very special collector who also loves Martha's work, those two things kept me going. So um, it is a lot of work to do something like this. I am honored to do it, don't get me wrong, but um, you know, I'm not, I'm definitely not the only one. There are people like me all over this country, all over the world, who had a parent who perhaps just never thought that there, the day would come when we would have to, I don't want to say dispose of, I know that's the legal term, but um, to um, make a safe home for the artwork. Um, I spent years in animal rescue. I still occasionally dabble in it. And um, this is not much different. I simply pivoted. I did that pandemic thing where I pivoted instead of rescuing animals. I'm mostly now rescuing artwork and an artist from possible oblivion and possible, you know, omission from the history books. So thankfully, again, largely because of the Center for Art Law, that's not going to happen. The, uh, the oblivion won't be a problem. But nonetheless, we still have all this other storage. Now, that's the big problem is um, where do I put all these things? You know, I've, I've already started asking clever people like MacGyver types, how can we hang some paintings on the ceiling? Because that's the only space I have left now in the apartment. So, the, you know, I've already got gallery style floor to ceiling. I'm sorry I didn't bring a slide of that. That's my bad. But um, I also have stacks of paintings that people can kind of, uh, you know, thumb through. Um, 
And so storage is a big deal, restoration, framing. Framing is a big one. My dad, God bless him, did a lot of the framing um, of my mom's work. He's not here anymore, alas. Um, I'm not, I don't think it's something he would want to do anymore anyway. So um, framing also will refresh and kind of contemporize the work. Is it time? Should I, should I stop? Um, and, um, um, but that, you know, that's again, that's a big responsibility of, of not just time, but money. So um, I'm trying to think if I left out any of the challenges um, that, that an heir to an artistic legacy faces. But again, um, I hope that they will embrace this, what some would think of as a burden, um, with joy because uh, I have learned so much in doing this. And I had already been around the art pool a few times. I've written about art for Newsday, New York Times, El Decor, House Beautiful, you name it. Um, but this, what has been an immersion course, I know that I disappointed my mother very much not going to graduate school. I'm the least educated person in our family with just a BA. Um, but um, this has been almost like a crash MFA for me. And so I couldn't be more grateful. Um, I would do this again in a minute. And um, finally, I want to conclude before I hand it over to Diana. Um, um, what is my legacy? <laughs> well, mine will be that I have this little property in upstate New York, and I am donating it to the Center for Art Law, and I hope other people will consider doing something similar, whether it's with the Center or with another nonprofit. So I'm donating it so that it can be a museum for women by women. So actually constructed, built, engineered, architect, designed, all of that by women. And it will be the first museum of its kind in the world where all women artists who want to be recorded there will be. Maybe not everyone will be exhibited right away, but everyone will be part of a database. They will have a, a belonging. And um, we're going to call it, if you look at the word museum and you take out the first you, it's going to be called the Ms. Eum. And <laughs> thank you. And so this will um, translate into any language. I'm hoping that people will steal the idea. Let us build it first. But I'm really hoping that people will steal the idea and that women artists around the, the globe will finally have places to call their own. I mean, it's very nice that artists with a little property would make a museum for themselves. Um, but, you know, that, that's okay, but I really feel like it should be more embracing of our fellow artists. So, that's all I have to say, other than thank you all again, and thank you to the center, thank you to Diana for listening to me, and take it away. Thank you. So, I'm, I'm sure a little bit of a feel of what a wonderful resource it is to have Julia with us today. And when we were preparing for this, just in hearing her wealth of knowledge of the experience of going through this, I thought that's, you know, that's what's really valuable to this audience. So rather than prepare a PowerPoint and go through some legal issues that we see, some of you may have seen me jotting down notes um, because I'm really going to play off of things that Julia mentioned because they're important to her as the child to an artist. And so I think that that's what's really going to resonate with a lot of this audience. So I'll go through some of those points and then Julia and I will continue with a discussion of some other questions. So at the very beginning, Julia's slide uh, with the photo with her mother. And she mentioned how this, the, the photo was, it's a family photo, but in many ways too, it's archival because it told her the orientation of the photo. So this is my first point of what we see happen with so many different artists' estates, often in an estate plan when artists are defining their art, their art property and what goes to which individual, estate planners will generally fall into this pattern of saying, 
personal property. And personal property, typically, when we're not talking about an artist's estate, would include family photos. But then with artist's estate, we also talk about the archive. And the archive could potentially go to a foundation or somebody else, not the children. So it really becomes a struggle with artist's estates to pierce through the material and decide what is considered personal property, what's a family photo that should go to the family that's important to the family, versus what would fall into the archive category that you would want potentially going to a foundation or staying with the other artwork, continuing on the legacy. So this is a very important conversation to have with the artist and as a family because the decisions truly vary. We've worked with artists where they say, absolutely everything is part of the archive. I feel very, very strongly about that. I want it all staying together. It's all a picture into my artistic career. And we've also experienced the conversation not being had and children of the artist being put into an executor position and reading for the first time that tangible property archive, the definitions are a little bit unclear and the reality that they may not get a family photo because it may be going to a foundation is something that's emotionally upsetting for them. So that's a starting point of when talking about the estate and working with lawyers, the definitions, particularly with artists, really do matter. Another thing that Julia showed us in our slides were the different styles that her mother had over her career. This is also something very common that we see with artists, that when looking at the body of their work, it changes over time. And it's not only different styles, but perhaps could be different mediums. And so the artist can explore different ways of expressing their creativity. And that goes into the next category that's, that's very relevant when you're talking about an artist's estate and the appraisal process is what is a finished work and what's not a finished work. So for some artists, drawings would be considered a finished work. For other artists, we have found that drawings are the mechanism that they would consider work product to get to a painting or a sculpture. And so having a clear picture from the artist of what it truly means to be a completed and finished work is something that is helpful in the estate administration process. And I didn't notice on these slides, but you tell me, did your mother, does your mother sign her work? Okay, so um, that's a really good question. Sometimes she does, and sometimes she does not. <laughs> and sometimes she does it on the front, and sometimes on the back. Sometimes it's just an M, sometimes it's just an MS. And by the way, I have spared you all many more slides because I forgot to mention that there are sculptures, there are bas-relief sculptures, there are silk screens, there are many, many photographs. There's a lot more media, so sorry I forgot that point, but okay, so yeah, sign, no, not always, that's the long answer. <laughs> and so that also becomes a very complicated issue that executors are often faced with, especially if the artist has prints and has additions. So in that way, really knowing the artist's wishes of, should it be signed in another way? Should there be some sort of signature um, posthumous works? Would the artist have wanted additions to be completed? These are all the types of questions that the executors will face from, from the appraisers as they're trying to get a good assessment of what is the art that is held by the estate. And so those questions, usually go to the children, um, and often the studio as well. So as Julia was also mentioning, th this is an enormous responsibility. And she mentioned that on the phone call we were saying, and, and it's really trying to work through that it's, it's a blessing, but it's also a burden that you take on. So to the extent that artists are able to provide guidance, letters of wishes during their lifetime to try to provide instruction for family members, executors, studio members later on, it's so helpful in the process to get that guidance, to ease some of 
the burdens that Julia was talking about. If I can just interject one thing. To this day, even the other day, my mother was saying, don't worry about the paintings. I'll take care of them. OK, just say it. OK, if I'm not speaking loud enough, please let me know if you can't hear me in the back. So another thing that Julia mentioned was the wealth of material that her mother had, um, as well as storage issues. So this is also something that produces the children of artists that are tasked with the executor position quite a lot of anxiety. Because when they think about just the sheer volume that they have to work through of what is the sales strategy, what is the donation strategy, they, they understand that that's going to take a, quite a long time to fully flesh out to truly respect the artist's market and the artist's legacy. So in the meantime, they say, oh my goodness, if I have to store all of this and art comes in various sizes um, and in varying volumes, it's, they start to think through the costs involved with that. So again, and, and just thinking about what's the plan, where's the art going to be stored as all of this is going on is really, truly helpful. And then another point, as I'm, I'm quoting Julia here, so you talked about gallery submissions. And also museums. Uh, museums, yes, and on the phone we talked about museums. So again, as this responsibility gets shifted on to the executors, which are often children, what we think through is what are certain ways that we can make this transition a little bit easier? How so, can I dump this art? Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> and so really thinking about if there is going to be a continued sales strategy, did the artist have a gallery representation during life? If they did, it was most likely verbal. So the question really becomes thinking through during the artist's life, is this something that you want to memorialize in writing and have it binding on the estate so that when the executor takes over and they're thinking about all of these different admin considerations, that at least a sales strategy is continuous for them, is one possibility depending on the artist and the artist market. Another point is often children will say to me, this is too much. I, I just don't want to deal with it. I'm happy to give it all away. And that's not, that's not as easy. <laughs> that's not as easy as it seems. And finding a house and a home for different art is, is truly not as easy as it used to be. A lot of these museums already have their storage facilities full. And they're thinking about the insurance responsibilities and the storage responsibilities associated with that. So trying to plan for that early is again going to ease the burden because it's very hard to do when you're thinking about it for the first time in the estate administration process. So those are some things that I noted. Um, oh, one more is smoking and restoration. <laughs> so smoking, don't do it, don't. <laughs> so this is definitely another burden that we see children taking on of the, the burden of the responsibility of not only could there be a wealth of material that you now are responsible for storing, but really the pressure of knowing that you're properly caring for the work. And so any type of instruction that can be given with regard to restoration and process is so valuable to give as guidelines to the children. So these are questions that, that we would hope that families have. We know that they're not the easiest conversations to have, but they're definitely the type of conversations and the type of information that we have found really eases a lot of the logistics in this, in this process. So with that, I have some questions. Um, that often I find that it, the families haven't necessarily thought through or that children don't have the information about that, that really add to the complexity of some of this. So, Julia, you mentioned um, that you, you and your mom just started talking about this about two years ago, and your mom right now is 93 years old. Yes, she'll, she'll be 94 in October. God willing. And um, yes, and I forgot to mention, there's so much to talk about, I didn't want to overgo. But um, two years ago, just about December 2019, I had a stroke. Go figure. Um, so that is really what 
you know, lit the fire under my behind to do something about these paintings because I found myself studying them and looking at them in new ways and then, oh my God, what if I die of a second stroke and then she goes to a nursing home and all these paintings end up in a dumpster. So I stayed awake for weeks, like worrying about this and that motivated me to really get a move on. But Diana makes an excellent point, pretty much to say it a lot less elegantly than she did. Museums don't want your damn artwork. I'm really sorry to tell you this. In the old days, like um, the heirs to an artist's estate, which is called the local museum, and they would take it. And sometimes it would come along with a nice big donation, so they would build a whole building, or they would uh, you know, annex an existing building or whatever to house it. That doesn't happen anymore. I mean, that's like the publisher's clearinghouse fantasy of art. Doesn't happen. So at, at 91, and I think this really illustrates that artists are living for a longer and longer time. So to start the conversation at 91 could work perfectly fine, um, but not, we're not always in a position where an artist can get to 91. Um, or can get to 91 in full capacity to be making those types of decisions. So that really is a point to stress of the earlier that you can talk about it and just have some conversations, get an idea, put something in place. And what we always say is flexibility is key. We can always change a plan as time goes along. And if you have this conversation with a parent when they're in their 60s and they live to be 93, there's plenty of time to reevaluate the plan when they're 70, 80, 90 to make sure that it still works given the body of the work and the market for the work. But to at least start with that, just in case you don't have the opportunity to have the conversation at a later stage is just something that we have truly found gives children so much comfort. And then- Can I ask you a quick question? What about if there's no time or inclination to write it down with an attorney? What about taking the cell phone and videotaping the artist saying what she or he wants? Would that count? So, so the videotaping is very helpful for guidance for you for in the same way letters of wishes would be so that you get a sense of what did she intend with a finished work or an unfinished work? And what is it that, that her goals are for keeping her legacy? But it's not going to legally bind us in the distribution. <laughs> Provide us a whole ton of help there. But the video is a really helpful way. We have done this with artists before that are, are hesitant to, to take to pen and paper and write down some guidance to just get a video of really their intention and their goals with their legacy we have found that executors have found that just helpful during the process and, and so have children. So it, it's a great idea. <laughs> and you also, so you are an only child. So this is this responsibility has, has fallen on, on you primarily for this. What we have found so much too is that the family dynamics are very important to think about as well. So if, you were an only child and this is not something you wanna take on, what are the other options? Who is best placed to do it? If we're dealing with multiple siblings, we generally find that this is, it's a very personal matter when it comes to their parents and their legacies. Um, they don't always agree. And typically what we find is one sibling has more of an interest and more of a knowledge than the other might. So really identifying who would be best placed to take on this responsibility and burden could also just help the siblings and their relationship going forward. So you had also mentioned, um, well, one question I have for you as to whether your mother ever talked about this in a way to give you a sense of what value we were talking about with your mother's collection, because when we talk about art, art is such a passion and it could be something that people create hundreds and hundreds of works, but we're talking about a lower, a lower value and perhaps not as much of a market for. So planning as the child for that type of legacy is very different from planning from a legacy where the value is so high that we're worried about the tax burden and how are we paying that tax bill. So that truly runs the gamut. And what I find is children don't typically 
hear a lot about value during life, and, and it becomes a little bit of a surprise during the process that we have to work with. So I'm, I'm so glad yeah. you said that, because that also goes with, like, what is my legacy from both points of view? So yes, value, value. So obviously, these things to me are treasures. They're obviously, these are the Sistine Chapel, you know, I, but I'm biased. Okay, but... Now, this painting, when it was first exhibited at a gallery that doesn't exist anymore called the Lynn Kotler Galleries, it was on 65th Street between Madison and 5th. Um, I was there. I trudged up those steps with my mother. I was there for the hanging. I was there for all of it. And, uh, you know, we're lucky that even post-stroke, I still have a darn good memory. So I happened to have the priceless this happens to have been the, the highest priced of, of the offerings um, in that show. And um, happily, I didn't mention the very happy news, I don't know if he's here, but the David Richard Gallery in Chelsea is going to have a show in a year from now, if we live that long. I hope we do. So, um, so the way he valued um, her paintings happily is practically almost like a um, inflation calculation, you know what I mean, price adjusted, um, of what it was then. So that's very happy. But yes, I appreciate that this is a, a challenge. And also, uh, for instance, a couple, one person actually tried to sort of downvalue uh, her work and I was like, well, how is that going to help you? He's, and he was like, well, I have a business to run. This is not, this is a different uh, gallerist out of New York. And I was like, well, how is that going to help you as a business if you're going to downvalue it? But more importantly, from my point of view, is this nonprofit aspect and for the Ms. Eam and for the Center for Art Law and for all nonprofit um, initiatives that anyone would want to do, why would you want to undervalue it? So definitely... Valuation is key, and yes, emotion is going to play into it, but I think that's good. I hope you agree. Mm -hmm. and, and I think Julie, even having kind of some knowledge of what prior market values had been for her mother's art is extremely helpful because, again, it, we're planning with different things when it's an artist with a robust market versus an artist who potentially doesn't have a robust market. We're really looking at different strategies and different things that we need to be thinking about to ease this burden and responsibility because the responsibility is different based on value. And often we find that the executors, when they're children, are stepping into a position of not necessarily having that information beforehand. And we're working with it as we go. So Julia, also of your mother's body of work, would you say, are there any works that have nostalgic, sentimental value to you? They all do. Um, I have found that it's like, um, you, you know, I'm, I'm, but I'm learning to detach. This is something I should have, you know, learned a long time ago. It takes me a long time sometimes, even without a stroke. And, um, but yes, I'm learning to detach and just look at them as, you know, not my children, right? Not my siblings. I think it's more fair to the art. I think it's more fair to the legacy, to the, the art history. So, um, so yeah. So, in fact, I happen to be um, working with um, a woman printmaker to make... <laughs> I want to make a triptych print of this because this is actually going to a collector, the wonderful collector I mentioned before who really, he calls my mother a wonderful painter. He's very, uh, you know, supportive. So this is going to him and so is another painting that I, sorry, I didn't bring a picture of that is at the restorer and it's finished, but it wasn't dry. I was gonna bring it here, but um, it's a portrait of my grandfather. So it's just called Father, it's Martha's father. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> so those two are going to him I was going somewhere with this. Help me out. What, what, where, uh, oh, right. So I'm making a pr because it's hard for me to let this go. Since since childhood, I've loved this. It was made in 1975. So I'm because my mother's losing her sight. I've rationalized this away that I'm going to have a print made, turn it into a triptych, divide it up into three, and then make it bigger, so that low vision people can see the image better. And then it'll also have a very contemporary flavor with a white frame, 
boom, 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 occupying a nice big wall space. So that's my way of kind of like <clears throat> hanging on to it. Yes, it's very hard to get to let go. This and also film noir I would like to make into a print because there are so many film film nonprofits now and people are so very beautifully aware of film as an art form so i want it to try to have a life in those places just for the really for the enjoyment of the people who are programming films my mother and i used to go to the museum of modern art um, on my vacation from college and see movies you know and now anyone can turn on the TV and see Turner Classic Movies. But at that time, that was still very special. And I believe they were programmed by Peter Bogdanovich, the late great. So anyway. And that, that emotional aspect and connection to the art is one that's so important to make sure, again, is something that is thoughtfully part of the plan. Because we have always found that children have strong feelings about the art in one way or another. It brings back memories of childhood, either positive or at times traumatic. Um, and so there, there definitely is a strong feeling of, of certain works that children may want to keep. So keeping that in mind that this is, it's not only about the artist's legacy, but this is really a family endeavor that the entire family lived with, with the artist's career, and making sure that that's prob properly reflected in a plan as well is also a conversation that families should have to be thoughtful about. So there is so much more that Julie and I could talk about, um, but I know, as we said in the beginning, we're, we're happy to open this up to more questions. And for my part of this, I, I did truly just play off of what I heard from Julia because our conversations about this really resonated with me as, as what I've heard from so many children of artists. And so in some ways, I feel like that's so comforting for those in the audience who are in a similar experience, just to know that, that you're not alone in thinking through the burdens of these responsibilities. Um, but we go in depth into all of the legal issues related to this. If you do want more of a resource, um, in, in the audience is one of my co-authors of the Art Law Treatise, and we have an entire chapter that's solely related to planning for artists because we know what an important area this is. Um, but while you have Julia and I here, are there any other questions that that you would like to raise or hear from us? Well, I want to say one thing. Um, I'm going to out you because um, Diana is a painter and has studied art. So I think this is a wonderful, she's a treasure to because she has that emotion, but she's kept it at bay. So it's, I really admire um, Diana a lot, and I'm grateful to be sharing this space with you. Thank you so much. I will open up. Okay. <laughs> Julia, that, I'm yeah. curious about your mother's wishes because it's oh, me. Here you are. Sorry. Um, you know, you've talked a lot about what your plans are with the legacy, but I'm curious if your mother is still able to express what her desires are. And once she dies, you know, even if you have a power of attorney that disappears, has she made a plan in her will that allow, like let's say you can't make that print until after she dies, do you have the power to make prints of a work that she made when she's dead? I'm just curious about that. Um, okay, well, that's a very excellent question. Um, okay, so one thing I can say, my mother um, seems to be very happy with what I'm doing. She's very approving um, when, you know, uh, when the work was accepted at the Vassar College Museum, she was very excited and, you know, uh, we went there together uh, to deliver it and um, she thought it was already going to be up, you know, we had just brought it. Anyway, so, so um, you know, there's that tenuous sort of, um, she's here and she's not, but um, um, she seems to be happy with everything I'm doing. She Let's put it this way, she hasn't vocally said stop it you know she's she's aware and at one point i kind of crumpled up on the couch after a long day of hearing no 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 and she came over to me and it was really sweet and she put her hand on my shoulder and she said i'm sorry this is such hard work so she's she's aware that i'm kind of you know uh i mean i call her 
my favorite artist. I've called her that in in articles in in media. And, you know, so um, I think I think she's okay with it. You know, and um, hey, if not, sue me. Uh, so, but um, but I can see where that might be a conflict of somebody because um, really, my mother made this work even though it was exhibited and uh, most recently in two, from 2003 to 5 in a show at the New York Historical Society which the distinguished curator who is sitting in the second row Kathleen Halser co-curated um, so it has been exhibited through the 70s at the Kotler Galleries and in between in the 90s at Art Students League so it's, it has been shown um, she is happy to have it shown and celebrated but really she did it for herself so I am, I am very respectful of that because I, and I believe that that's what led me to have this urge to create the museum. I wouldn't be doing this if my mother, you know, she really did these things for herself. And at one point in my frustration, I said, why didn't you promote yourself? You know, anyway, and she was like, because maybe I wasn't ready. And you know, we, I, I have to respect that. It is all about timing and it's, it is her life, it is her work. So I'm thankful that um, you know, she's with me on this um, voyage and this journey. But yes, this is a very important question because if a parent objects to something, God knows the kid can be arrested. And we generally find that artists fall into two categories. One, they feel very strongly about what their le legacy should be and want to dictate a lot of that process. But quite a majority, we find, are just as happy to say, let my children determine for me. This is it. something that, uh, that, right, you do it, you That's handle I it. You. <laughs> I created the art for myself. And now what my legacy will be, will be determined later. And so do you feel that your mother fell into one or the other of the two categories? Well, I feel really, and this is gonna sound weird, but I, I do feel like I was born to do this. Like, I think I was an accident. My parents had me on the later side. They were in their late thirties at that time. That was unusual. Um, and I do believe that in the back of certainly my mom's mind that, that I was, you know, the mother of her artwork. I was gonna take care of it. And, but unfortunately, that wasn't outlined to me. I had to figure it out and look at how long it took me, my goodness. So um, I'm, a slow, I'm slow on the uptake. But yeah, so I hope this helps everyone else who's in. And by the way, I wanna say that one of the people who's in this boat with me, and of course I've forgotten his name again, but he's the son of the sculptor of nothing less than the Iwo Jima Memorial in DC. So Murphy, you might remember his name. I. But at any rate, um, he's, a, he's a filmmaker and an actor, and he's making a movie about his dad. Well, good luck with that too. So I can't imagine a more difficult, another more difficult milieu than the art world. Well, that's Hollywood. So, but he's doing it because he's also very proud of his parent, his creative parent, and um, and even though he's he's not here anymore, he's passed away. He's doing it because he feels that's what he would want. But I'm curious to know if he has that in writing to mm -hmm. do it. I bet he doesn't. I bet his father didn't say, make a movie about me. That doesn't sound right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. So, Diana, you mentioned that there's a chapter in a book that yes. um, describes the process. Could you repeat the name, the title of that book? Sure. So we will. We can. We can circulate in the information. Um, so it's it's called Art Law, and the authors on that are Ralph Lerner, Judith Bressler, and Diana Warbicki. It's on Amazon. I hope. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna send her website too. And and so. Um, that that will, pre but when you talk about process, I do recall on the conversation earlier, I was asked to talk a little bit about documentation. So let me just give you the basics here of what we're thinking about. So in terms of, of an estate plan, if wills, powers of attorney, 
um, healthcare proxy, those basic things, whether we're layering on to that with a trust, those are th some things that we would consider. Uh, but also in terms of documentation, again, I mentioned before, if you're working with a gallery already and that's a relationship that you would like to have continued on, or if you as a ch the children feel like this is already quite a burden and you've gotten used to having interactions with that particular gallery and just want to continue the process, that's documentation to start thinking about for the representation agreement. As we said, gifts are very, very difficult to make later on at the time of, of the estate administration. So to think through if there are any promised gift agreements that can be made during the artist's life is also helpful documentation to have. Oh, also, one other thing. One other thing, where are, and Irina brought this up too, where are some of my mother's works? Because they have been collected over the years. So. Uh, unfortunately, a few of the collectors have also passed away, so I'm working to find those people too. Yes, the, the inventory process. So who the artist worked with, it's not always only a gallery, it's also publishers. Publishers tend to be the list that the children tend not to know about, that we have to do a little bit of digging of who, who has what in terms of prints. So that's always good to start keeping a record of where things are. In speaking of location, one thing that we've seen that comes up that can make estate plans a little bit tricky for artists' estates is if bequests, different gifts that are determined in the estate plan, the beneficiaries are decided based on the location. So if something is located in the studio, then X person gets it. If something's located in the apartment, then Y person gets it. We've seen this in a few different estate plans. It becomes very difficult when we're then administrating the estate because that estate plan could be written 20, 20 years before the passing and things move. And so then you often have beneficiaries saying, wait, 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 I knew that was going to me. I know it's in the apartment, but 10 years ago it was in the studio. So just to be very careful if you are thinking through a plan to not make it location specific would be a piece of advice. Thank you. Do we have any more questions from the audience? Hello, good evening. I'm just curious about uh, legal entities. Um, is, it, is there one legal entity that you would consider ideal for artist estates as giving the most flexibility to the ones running the estate? And second question, if I'm a living artist and for instance I operate under a corporation, if I pass away, is the estate better off started as a new entity or can the corporation transform into the estate? So it's just a legal uh, entity question. I'm just curious. Yes, so, so very fact specific. Um, it, many artists will have a LLC in place if they're operating through a studio when they sell their works, then they're doing it through that particular structure. But a discussion of whether the entity owns the artwork, whether the artwork is owned individually, is all going to be part of the discussion in the estate plan. Unfortunately, there's not sort of one set rule that is going to work best for everybody, but it is definitely an important consideration to have uh, when transferring the art during the estate plan. Many times, if family members do not have the knowledge about the art, artists do think about who is best placed to manage that art and could be the manager of an LLC or could be the trustee of the trust to facilitate the process. So structures are helpful. It's just one size doesn't fit all. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Any any last questions? Final people? Oh, yeah. Okay. It'll be a good one. <laughs> it's not a question, but just because this you're talking about an artist who's probably under recognized, there's actually an article coming out about Martha Zabo's work, which you saw up here, and it's published by the two people sitting next to me. And alas, we we're gonna have the magazine here, but uh, it's not out yet, but it's called Gallery 
and studio, and it's the uh, spring issue? Yes. Spring 2022 issue. And if you go to galleries, it's distributed free there, but uh, look it up online and you can find out more about this artist. And that's Thanks. Kathleen Halter, the distinguished curator. That was a great honor when Kathleen came to my mom's studio and she um, looked through so much art and made so many amazing, um, insightful observations and comments. Thank you. And we I'm love not you. I'm going to tell them what your rescue dog did. Why? <laughs> <laughs> See, I told you it's all about rescue. It never stops. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much, Julia and Diana. <laughs> thank you. I think that was eye-opening, it was exciting, and a great conversation. All of the magazines, the books that we've mentioned, I will include them in the handouts, and I will send them across, along, as I mentioned earlier, with a recording of the session and the PowerPoints. So just a reminder to make sure that you sign up at the back with your email ID, so we're able to send across all of the material to you. And if you can take the time to once again scan this QR code, it'll give you a link so you can fill up a survey and that'll help us curate more programs and um, address topics that you're interested in with the National Arts Club and with a lot of other organizations and institutes. So we hope to see you at a lot more events. And once again, thank you so much to both of you. It was so wonderful having you here. Thank you. Thank you.